one that shares a name with one of the most influential magazines of all time. For decades, Rolling Stone has been at the forefront of music and culture. And joining us now is the force behind what has been one of the most iconic publications in history. Founder, co-editor, and publisher of Rolling Stone, Jan Wenner. He's out with his new memoir entitled Like a Rolling Stone. Uh, and Reverend Al Sharpton is also back with us for this conversation as well. Jan, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, so let's start with the name. Uh, obviously, the Dylan <laughs> song came out a couple of years before uh, you began the magazine, The Stones, of course, uh, several years before. Um, talk about the name, uh, Rolling Stone. Uh, did you pick it up from the Dylan well, song, from the Stones, or from the well, poem? Well, honestly, from, from the Dylan song. It was a title of an essay was, which was written by my co-founder of Rolling Stone called Like a Rolling Stone, which laid out all the philosophical underpinnings and the ideas of Rolling Stone. And that was based on that song, Like a Rolling Stone. Now, in later years, the Stones have said that I named after them, Bob claims the otherwise, and the truth is, it's, yeah. it's Dylan. And, but we shared the yeah. name for years with the Stones, so. Yeah, so, um, so I, I, I have a copy of the first issue of Rolling Stone. Uh, it, I think it's John Lennon, uh, an image from How I Won the War. I love what you said about why you used that picture, which, which, ta which really shows, you know, how, how you, you were a 21-year-old kid, you had no idea how this was going to explode, but you just said, hey, you know what? I was just looking for free pictures. And you found that one, and it's what an iconic first cover for Rolling Stone. Absolutely, and it suggested all the things that we become well known for, politics, coverage of movies, and of course, music. Yeah, can, can I ask you, is on the topic of John Lennon, uh, without, I, I, think, I don't think there's really competition. The most iconic interview of all time, 1970, you, and John Lennon, and it's right before Lennon came out with Plastic Ono Band, and he just unloaded on the Beatles. It was, it was a shocking interview. Um, talk about how you got it, and if you understood the second uh, you turned off the tape recorder that you were going to make rock history. Well, I, I didn't realize really the full impact of what it was going to mean. It was certainly the first time John had ever been interviewed or spoken out about what it was like to be in the Beatles and who they were and who wrote the songs. Before that, remember, they were lived in a bubble. They were the lovable mop tops, and nobody could penetrate that bubble. But John decided to, you know, let it out and tell the true story. And he did it for me because I kind of was, had been courting him over a while, but also we had been supporting him with the Two Virgins cover, they used to call all the time uh, to Rolling Stone to tell us what their peace activities were. This is John and Yoko. And adopted us as kind of their spokespeople in print, you know, their defenders and who they would talk to. And so when it time to do, came time to do the interview, which I've been pursuing them about for three years, he just let it out. He was also in therapy at the time, and he just felt like letting it all out. And was I shocked? Yes. Was I surprised at the amount of publicity it got? Enormously surprised. It was on the front page of papers around the new, around the world, everywhere. Lennon breaks up the Beatles and so forth, like that. Um, we called it Lennon Remembers. Later on, John started calling it Lennon Regrets. <laughs> Jan, Jan, good morning. I mean, Rolling Stone is so iconic now. It's hard to remember that there was a time when you started this magazine at 21 years old where you had no, as you said, no money, no business plan, and no real ambition about it. You just wanted to write about music. So when did it explode for you and become something else and say, oh, this is going to be my life's work and we're going to expand beyond music and look into politics and, and the world? Well, the, the declaration that we were going to go beyond, we were going to go beyond music into politics and to Big things started fairly early. I mean, fairly early on, we had the Altamont issue to do, the Altamont story, and we also had the Charles Manson story. We did th both those things and won a National Magazine Award, our first ever front doing that when we were, it was in like 1970, I believe. Um, but I guess there was a point came where the financial exigencies of the moment became overwhelming, and I really had to look at myself and think to myself, what do I really want to do this in a career? You know, because if so, I'm going to have to really buckle down and go raise some more money and, you know, get get on it. And I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll stick with this thing. And I went out and stuck with it. And then it just gradually uh, 
escalated over the years, you know, not again with any business plan in particular, but, you know, a lot of <laughs> ambition. Well, and you know, uh, you and I have talked down through the years, and one of the things that was interesting to me, uh, uh, we did a couple of things in, in the magazine on my political and civil rights stuff, but you and I would talk music in, in your right. office. I remember long conversation we had about James Brown, who was like a father to me. But uh, Michael Jackson, who I did the eulogy for both James Brown and Michael Jackson's funeral. Michael used to talk about how Rolling Stone and you helped break through in terms of putting black artists on the cover. And I don't think a lot of people understand that the music world in terms of the established media was not as inclusive uh, as you helped to make it by cover stories, by making them pop mainstream artists. Right. They, it was almost like a segregated, you're over here in R&B, and you kind of helped break that up. We, Michael was on the cover when he was 11 years old. Right. But we were, from the beginning, really devotees of rhythm and blues and the blues, and understood that rock and roll came from black music. It was originated. I mean, that's where, that's where it's from. So we are absolutely straightforward about it and on, loved the music itself and wanted to honor those people who created it. It's part of the soul of Rolling Stone and the history of it. And really, almost in a way, more than sports, helped to integrate the armed forces, sports, and music was what integrate, helped integrate the country. So we were, yeah. we, yes. Oh, oh I'm so, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to get to Al. But once Al came in the office years ago and to speak to our board of editors when he was running for president, we remember, and he just dazzled everybody with his knowledge and stories about James Brown. He had them on, had us on the floor. So, you he know, of course, we had to publish all that. But they didn't endorse me for president. <laughs> well, you know, I mean. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, awkward. Next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. <laughs> Jan, I, I, keep, this is Jan's I, day. I keep telling Reverend Al, write the book about oh God, James please. Brown, baby. Write the book. Great. And Reverend Al always says, I can't print most of the stories. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the problem. So, so, Jan, help me out here. So I was born in 63. Most of the music that, um, most of the music that, from 64 to 70, uh, the, the era I, I really sort of, with the British invasion to the Beatles breaking up, but all the incredible things that happened over those six years. I mean, it's some music I've listened to my entire life, and I've never heard anything better. I, I, even going into the early 70s, it's so funny listening to the Eagles. The Eagles say, you know, the weird thing is, you know, Henley said this when he was alive, and uh, our, our Henley is Glenn alive, of course, alive. but 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 Glenn, yeah, but but Glenn Glenn Fry said this when he was alive, and Henley said it as well. They play our songs now more than they did back when we were together. What was it about 64 to say 74 or 75, if we want to take Hotel California? What was it about that era that was so extraordinary? Well, it's an era in which lifestyle, awareness, politics, the spirit of youth were all totally aligned with the music, and in which a group of artists came together when the the, the, the unique for their times. I mean, a guitar playing on Hotel California. The writing about what was going on today. I mean, it was just a very unique period in history. But also, to, as of today, I mean, today, every bit of that music is available everywhere in the world at all times, free, if you're carrying a phone around. And therefore, it's been accessible to so many people who are were not, uh, young, were not young then or not, or not even alive then, and they've had the opportunity to see it. Look at this picture gallery, my God. Yeah, uh, amazing. I, who are these people? Oh, I know them. Um, and um, so it, it lives that way. It's not the popular music of today. Today's popular music is a different kind of thing among young people. It's Taylor Swift or Harry Styles or all the rap stuff. Uh, names I don't can't even remember, have no idea who they are. But uh, the basic rock and roll canon thrives and lives and will live for a long time, although it's not the music that sells records today. Those acts, like the Eagles, go out on the road, and they don't make money selling records, they don't make the records anymore, but they make tons touring, and I think that's great for all of us. I mean, what a benefit. Yeah. I'd love to go see the Eagles or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and Paul McCartney, and of lucky course, you. finished up a tour. Not born too late.
Yeah, not not born too late. Very yeah. lucky me. And by the and by the way, apologies to Don Henley, who's very yeah. much still alive. It, yes, we do a four hour show, and yes. sometimes we get tired. We do. Yeah. And oh. so, Jan, I hate to ask you this with just a few seconds left, but is there a favorite or a most powerful cover or a cover you regretted? Well, I mean, the cover I regretted was the Boston Bomber cover which cost us a lot in, in people's mm -hmm. affection and love and some advertising. I, it was, although it was a very legitimate news cover and a good cover, I really didn't at that point understand that the American people and our readers viewed the Rolling Stone cover as, as something you earned and mm. you deserved and you and gave, conferred a little bit of heroic, iconic status. So I missed that beat. And it turned out to hurt a lot of people's feelings. Sorry about that. The most iconic cover we ever did was the cover that Annie Leibowitz took of John Lennon and Yoko Ono just on the eve of his assassination. And it wow. features him naked, curled up around Yoko on a bed. And that's what they were wanting to do for the cover of Rolling Stone for their new album was coming out. And that's the cover in the middle there. And it, Rolling Stone almost, it evokes the very first anniversary issue cover of them naked together, which put us on the map, really, and uh, evokes death. And it's a, like a, it's, it's been called like the modern Pieta. You know, it's, it's a really yeah. sad and super strong cover. And I think one so, every uh, magazine cover of the decade award or something. Yeah, no, it was extraordinary. And I've got to say, I've got to say the, the, uh, the entire issue, I remember it all. I remember the incredible writing. Uh, talking about, uh, I think it was the Kirk Douglas movie that uh, the the author watched over and over again. I think it was Spartacus, and he kept watching it, knowing how it was going to end. And he kept replaying uh, John Lennon's uh, those events over and mm -hmm. over in his head, knowing how it was going to end. Uh, front to back, uh, one of the most extraordinary magazines I well, think that's ever and been published. Chances are, uh, Joe will be reading this memoir front to back oh, as front well. Back. It's Show entitled. The Right, we're going to right now. Here it is. <laughs> it's entitled Like a Rolling Stone, Jan Wenner. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on the book and an incredible, incredible career. Thank you. And, Thank you. And, pleasure and to be Al. here with everybody. A pleasure. Well, a pleasure to have you. And Reverend Al, write your book on James Brown. Yeah, get it done. <laughs> Good we'll be God. right back.